Greater Houston is home to many world religions. These religions and their houses of worship demonstrate the wonderful mosaic of faith and culture that brighten the tapestry of our community. Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston is proud to present this video series as a part of our mission to educate people and reduce stereotypes. This series is presented by the Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships Department of Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston. It is also a celebration of the Brigitte and Bashar Kalai Plaza of Respect located at Interfaith Ministries main campus in Midtown Houston. Let's take a closer look at the elements of our houses of worship and work towards a better understanding of our religions and culture. Protestant Church emerged during Christian Reformation in the 16th century. The Protestant Reformation was a religious and historical movement that led to the splintering of Western Christianity from the Roman Catholic Church. It was initiated by Martin Luther and quickly spread throughout Europe. The church in modern culture is diverse and can vary widely from one denomination to another and from one region to another. My name is Reverend Eleanor Colvin. I'm the senior pastor here at Westbury United Methodist Church. And so you are in the sanctuary of Westbury, which is on the corner of Willow Bend and West Belfort in Southwest Houston. So what can a visitor expect to see or encounter when they enter into a Protestant church? When entering a Protestant church, you will more than likely enter into a space that we call the narthex. Um, more familiar terms might be like a lobby as you would enter um, a theater or some other space. So you'll enter a lobby gathering type space and likely be greeted um, by an usher or someone designated for the sole purpose of welcoming you into that faith community. And those people, the greeter or the usher, would help you find your seat and would also help you find a worship guide, which most people commonly call a bulletin. And so they might help you just acclimate to the space by welcoming you. So I'm John Worcester. I'm the pastor here at St. Philip Presbyterian Church. I've served here since 2012, and we are talking today in the sanctuary of, of the church, actually in the, the front of the sanctuary, a space we call the chancel. Uh, and and this, uh, this sanctuary space was built here in the early 1950s, but it's where this community of St. Philip worships uh, week by week on Sunday mornings and for other occasions too. It's sort of the heart of this congregation is its sanctuary. So what are the common elements of the worship space in a Protestant church? In a Protestant church, the most common elements and recognizable things would be the altar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In addition to the altar and its adornments, you have another space that we refer to as the altar, which often is where people might come forward and kneel for prayer or come forward and receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. You'll see crosses throughout the space, large, small, of all kinds. Um, you see the spaces up front where people would speak from. And so if you're a clergy person, you generally speak from what we call a pulpit. The non-clergy members, what we call the laity of the congregation, would speak from a lectern on a different side of the mm -hmm. church. That might also be the place where worship leaders lead music for the congregation. What is the significance of the Christian Bible and how is it used during a Protestant worship service? The Christian Bible is our sacred text in the Protestant faith and it is our source of understanding um, scripture that Jesus would have studied in his own lifetime, scripture that he would have taught. That's primarily the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, some might refer mm -hmm. to it as. And so that's where we learn the kinds of things that Jesus himself was learning. So what are the first four books of the New Testament 
often referred to by faith leaders? The first four books of the New Testament are referred to as the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke give us a narrative, chronological even account of Jesus's works. And then the Gospel of John um, is revered as a bit more um, poetic and just integrating the stories with a different type of um, with a different type of wisdom, but all four books collectively are referred to as the Gospels. Who leads a Protestant worship service and how are they identified? Mm -hmm. So um, the service uh, primarily would be led by ordained pastors um, or sometimes ministers, they would be called, that sort of interchangeable terms. Um, but in addition to the, the pastors or ministers leading a service, there might be participation from the congregation at large, maybe a reader um, uh, that uh, would come from the congregation to read some of the scripture lessons for the day, perhaps assist with some of the prayers. Um, and then likely there would be a choir too, um, to lead in the, in the music, um, and that may uh, primarily be members of the congregation who, who sing in the choir. How do Protestants gather for worship? Like what day, time, does it usually happen? How long does it last? There was a day and time when we could clearly say Protestant worshipers gather on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. <laughs> um, and nowadays that's still true for mm -hmm. some churches. Mm -hmm. And there are a variety of other times. So you might gather in a Saturday night service or in a Sunday evening service or at earlier times on Sunday morning. But generally speaking, most Protestant communities gather for worship on Sunday mornings. How should one dress when they are visiting a Protestant church? Is it a come as you are or is there a certain manner of dress? Yeah, this is, this is something that I, I think has, has changed a good bit over the, the 30 years or so that I've, that I've been uh, a pastor. Um, 30 years ago, it would be very unusual to find uh, a church in which the men were not wearing at least a jacket and, and not quite often a tie. Um, that's very rare now um, to have, uh, have men wearing jackets and ties, like occasional jackets here and there, mostly I think because the air conditioning uh, can be quite chilly. Um, so uh, so there's, there's been a, a much relaxed uh, kind of dress for, for worship. What are the common elements of a Protestant worship service? The basic pattern of Protestant worship for years is gathering, praise, proclamation, and response. So essentially there is welcoming music or prayer offered to invite us in and to gather us into the space and prepare us for worship. And then there's a time of praise and that could include anything from song to dance to um, uh, instrumentation, any way that we would lift up and offer praise to God. The proclamation segment of worship would include the reading of scripture as well as the preached mm -hmm. word of God. And then the response could include a variety of things, whether that's us coming to the altar in prayer, whether that's the giving of our um, gifts and offerings in church, coming forward to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, that's a response to um, God's, God's invitation through God's Word. So what parts of the service might a visitor be expected to participate in? A visitor might be expected to join in the singing. Oh. Um, we make that easy with whether there are hymn books in the pews or a song lyrics printed in the worship guide or even projected on the screen. You may be asked to join in prayer whether that's a printed prayer that we all read together, something like the Lord's Prayer, which we recite each week in worship here. Mm -hmm. So you might be asked to join in prayer or simply pray silently as one of the pastors or other leaders um, prays. What is the Lord's table and can a visitor participate if they visit on a communion Sunday? Yeah. 
So the Lord's table is, uh, is the, the piece of furniture we're <laughs> right in front for, uh, for, uh, for in this space for Presbyterians. And again, in some traditions, that might be called an altar. But it's where communion is celebrated. We, that sacrament has other names, sometimes called the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, um, sometimes called Eucharist. Um, and different traditions would ha- will have different um, policies regarding participation. For Presbyterians, and certainly here at St. Philip, everyone is welcome to receive communion when it is celebrated. Um, other traditions might have um, some different uh, feelings about that, but in our case, um, it's what we, ha- we have what we call an open table, uh, and that everyone is invited. It's not, we say it's not a Presbyterian table, it's not the table of St. Philip, it's the Lord's table, and everyone is invited to receive communion. Reverend Colvin, what is the role of the church in a Christian community, and how does it shape the identities and values of the congregation? I believe the role of the church in Christian community is to help equip people to live out God's call on our lives, to help us reflect the image of God in this world, to be the hands and heart and feet of God at work, helping to make disciples for the sake of the world's transformation. And so it's the church's work to give people what they need, whether that is biblical instruction or some other type of um, support, perhaps, with respect to learning what their unique gifts are and how they might serve in the world. But that's, that's our responsibility, to help prepare people to live well in community and to be prepared to serve others. How does the church serve as a center for spiritual, cultural and social activities Mm -hmm. and how do those activities help foster a sense of identity, belonging and continuity among Christian people? Yeah, for as a spiritual gathering place, um, obviously our our worship services are the primary means uh, for that. Well, we we do well have um, um, occasions in the church year where we will have noontime services, for example, and the, and the building will be open uh, to folks from in uh, the community who are w- at work and might have a, a time at lunch to come for, for a noon uh, worship service. Um, for, in terms of cultural um, activity, uh, music is very important in this, uh, in this space, in this congregation, and we have uh, several, several concerts uh, through, the, through the year here with different arts organizations in Houston like to, to come and present concerts in this space because of its acoustic uh, dynamic. Um, the organ that we have here um, is, is utilized quite frequently in, in organ concerts and so the, the music life of uh, this congregation has a kind of a cultural significance. Um, and then you know, in, terms of, in terms of a social space or a gathering space uh, in that sense, we have a, a number of community groups that, that meet in the church uh, through, the, through the week. These would include you know, AA and other 12-step groups. Um, we have some, some wellness groups that meet here, also some neighborhood groups uh, that, that come too. And, and so throughout the entire week, people are coming to St. Philip for any number of, uh, of activities um, kind of beyond our, our Sunday, Sunday worship. Okay. So in closing, is there anything else you want to add or say that we haven't asked? My hope is that this type of conversation will encourage people who are contemplating a faith step but are unsure about it to go ahead and take that step. That people will know that there are folks of all faith traditions that already love them and are ready to welcome and receive them in their worship spaces. Thank you so much, Reverend Colvin, for your time and for welcoming us to your beautiful space here at Westbury United Methodist Church. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Be blessed. Thank you. Religious diversity in in our city is is really a distinctive feature. Um, No place I've ever been or lived or served, uh, no place really I know of, uh, has the kind of religious diversity that we have uh, in Houston. I think so. The opportunity in this series to hear about uh, these different houses of worship across our community I think is really vital and, and useful and and um, and educational. And I'm grateful for a chance to talk a little bit about uh, kind of Christian traditions. And I'm looking forward through this series to learning more about other religious traditions in our city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Worcester, for this time 
and sharing your insight to our viewing audience. Again, thank you. Yeah, thank you.